God's holding on, and so you hold on to him, and he holds on to us. Hey, I just want to say welcome myself. I know you've been welcomed in, but man, welcome to you, whoever you are and wherever you're joining us from. Uh, it's so good that we can set aside some time just to honor God, to seek God together, to come before him and his word and... Um, you know, they told us you can't meet right now uh, in gatherings, but we can meet online. And so here we are, wherever you're joining us from, your kitchen, your bedroom, your dining room, your bathroom, I don't know where you are, but man, I'm really glad that, that we all get to be together. And we're going to continue to meet. Um, you know, throughout the week, uh, I know that Groups Ministries got some great stuff planned, and groups are going to be connecting online. I know kids and students have some ideas. I got a call from the kids' ministry saying, hey, will you be prepared to do a magic trick for uh, the kids yeah, this week? And I'm just like, well, okay. So I, I know they got some fun things planned, a little bit of crazy stuff. Stay tuned on that. So just because our physical campuses are closed for a while, um, we're going we're gonna to stop going to church, but uh, we are not going to stop being the church, all right? That, that's what's going on right now, friends. Uh, this whole coronavirus is a crisis thing. We know that. But it's an incredible opportunity for the people of God to rise up and to seize the moment and to step into it in ways that God leads us to. So I would just say, you know, wash your hands, wash your hands. That's great, great, great. But let's look for ways to wash feet and to really serve our community, to just be there for people. You're going to see opportunities to step up and, uh, and we'll be the church. Church has never been a place. It's never been a building. It's always, always, always been the people. And we remember that right now for sure. It's not an activity you go to once a week. It's, a, it's an identity you embrace for your whole life. It, it's the people, right? So that's what we're doing right now. Most of all, church is not, um, is not a place you go to have your needs met. Friends, the church is the people of God who know that Jesus has met our deepest need and now he sends us to meet needs and be on the lookout for how we can do that together and on your own in your neighborhoods. We know one of the big needs right now is that a lot of people are stressed out. A lot of people have some panic. A lot of people have anxiety, and we're going to address that. You remember a few months ago when, if you heard the word corona a few months ago, you would probably think about the beer commercial. Remember the beer commercial where you, you had literally people sitting on the beach thinking about relaxing, idyllic you know, things and relaxation? Okay, so we've been in this series right now reminding us that that uh, that is not what people think about when they hear the word corona anymore. The series is called Anxious for Nothing. And, you know, God's timing is just so perfect because before this pandemic outbreak hit, we planned this thing. And then all is leading up in the middle of this thing, we were talking about ways that God's word could help us with our anxiety. And so, um, you know, if you think about it, that first word of the word, the first part of the word anxious has the word like angst in it. And that's because it comes from the same root word. And, and when you're anxious, you have angst. You have a dread about the future. And that's how a lot of people feel. So we thought we were going to be moving on and starting a new series uh, today. God had other plans. Uh, we're calling an audible uh, because things started dropping off and stopping. You know, NBA went down and March Madness. You should have seen how depressed Jared Fox was when we got word that there was going to be no March Madness this year. But all this stuff is shutting down and the anxiety kept ramping up. And, and so we're, we're just going to step into that um, and and. And keep going with some things that we think God has some more to say from his word about this. Uh, you know, the coronavirus is, is no joke. Um, you know, it's pandemic. People can get sick and die and all of that. But I promise you this, my friends. The, the, the biggest problem and the greatest threat in America today is not the coronavirus. It's the, it's the presence of panic. It's the sort of sickness of soul that just leads a person to worry and fret and sort of lose their life and get caught in the prison of anxiety. And that's what the real epidemic is when we kind of lose our way. And so we're going we're gonna to speak into that. And we also want to say, you know, um, as we do this kind of audible, that God just wants us to be able to win the war on worry and, and to replace some of the panic with, with peace. 
And as we go at this deal, we've been careful to say every week, you know, it's, it's, it's not a, a thing that is simple. We don't mean to make light of, of, of anything with mental health or anxiety. In fact, we want to say, you know, it, it, it's a multi-pronged approach that often is needed. It may take diet or exercise or counseling or therapy or medication, whatever. But we also know this, anxiety has deep spiritual roots and it has deep spiritual resources as well. So we're going to go to God's Word and call on this familiar passage once again that we've been looking at over the last several weeks. And I know a lot of you are just joining us, so maybe go catch those other messages. But you can catch up with us today because we're going to look at a passage in the book of Philippians. It's written by a guy named Paul. It's helpful to kind of back up and get the context here and remember this. Paul is a guy who went to Rome on a mission. He had a purpose for going there, but listen... His plans got canceled by the government, okay? Sound familiar? He is, you could say, quarantined indefinitely, right? He's in prison. No Netflix in prison, although it's even worse. And he's chained up to a Roman guard 24 hours a day, so I don't know, he probably couldn't touch his nose or mouth or face either, couldn't shake anyone's hand, so our situation's exactly like his, I guess, right? Maybe his might be a little worse since he is facing certain torture or death. The point is, if anybody could feel anxious and had an excuse for having anxiety, it would be Paul. And yet, here he is, not only just in prison, he's got peace. So he writes this letter from jail about joy. And so we're going to put the words on the screen so everyone, wherever you're watching from, we can read it together. Can I just encourage you when we do that, read it out loud. There's just some power in that. And also just it'll help us feel more united as we're all in our different places kind of reading these words from Philippians chapter 4, verses 4 through 9. Let's bring the words up and let's read it together. Here we go. You ready? Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again. Rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. Whatever you have learned or received or heard from me or seen in me, Put it into practice, and the God of peace will be with you. Thanks for reading that together with me. I hope you notice the way he ends that whole passage. He gets done talking about worry, prayer, thanks, and all of that stuff. And what does he say? He says, put it into practice. We make like Elvis. It's time for a lot less talk and a lot more action. He's saying, it's great that you understand this and heard this. And friends, I would just say this is, could not be more relevant to us right now. Now's the time to put it into practice. Put it into practice. Like, do this stuff. And let's change the way that we get through tough times, the default paths that we normally have coped with things. Let's change that. Put it into practice, and the God of peace will be with us you and me, as much as they were with Paul. Now, we don't have a vaccine yet. Uh, they're working on it, but we do have four antidotes to anxiety, and we kind of have been spelling the word calm with those. We'll review those quickly, and again, if you're just joining us, you know, go back to previous weeks, but it spells the word calm. C, remember, stands for celebrate, where he talks about rejoicing in the Lord always. A is ask God. That's the prayer piece, because prayer is the pathway to peace. If it's big enough to worry about, it's big enough to pray about. And then L is list it. That's our gratitude, our attitude that just says, man, it's the best antidote we have for anxiety, is thinking of what we're thankful for. And then last week, we talked about M for mindfulness, like mind your mind, because how you feel in your gut starts in your brain. And if we can get some bad stuff out and good stuff in, the peace of Christ will guard it and keep it that way. So Paul doesn't just teach this stuff. He's sitting in jail, putting on a clinic for how to do it. And he says, now do what I do. Now you do it. So here's, here's the important thing I think we've got to understand. Belief 
always drives behavior, okay? Belief always drives behavior. What you believe, like in your head and in your core convictions about things, determine the way you believe. So if you believe a bunch of dumb and bad stuff, it's going to come out in your life in unhealthy ways. If you have some good things that you believe, the truth, it's going to help you and you're going to be more healthy. And so nothing reveals what your beliefs actually are about God and life faster. Nothing brings your beliefs to the surface quicker than a good old-fashioned panic storm. Like, for example, maybe a pandemic, okay? So that's what's going on. And Paul says if you're anxious and you feel anxiety, don't just look at the symptoms. Look at what's inside with your belief system and your assumptions, because your behavior reflects your beliefs. So we want to learn from Paul because he, he can show us a couple of huge beliefs that if we get right will really help us in the battle against anxiety. Now, a lot of, a lot of people these days are going to the CDC website, uh, Center for Disease Control, right? It's a good source to go for information and so forth. That's great. But we're, we're, we're going we're gonna to remember to go to CDC, all right, three letters that spell out these core beliefs. And can you believe that God thought of this 2,000 years ago? He gave us an outline that goes with CDC. Who knew? The first C we're going to talk about right now is this, calm, calm is contagious. Calm is contagious. Isn't that true? Calm is contagious. Let me tell you a story. It's about an unsung hero back in 1962 during the Cuban Missile Crisis, all right? His name was Vasily Arkhipov. It's a fun name to say, Vasily Arkhipov. He was this commodore, um, the chief of staff, if you will, over a fleet of like four Russian submarines that came within a trigger pull of destroying the world, honestly. They were part of a Soviet fleet that was commissioned to go out with some secret instructions that they were only going to open once they got to sea. And what they thought they were going to do is like do a, a usual training mission out on the Siberian coast or something like that. But in fact, they were directed 5,000 miles southwest down to guard the, the city of Havana, Cuba. Now, the sailors on that sub were severely tested over the next three weeks. Uh, they, they surfaced that sub so they could go faster, and they went right into the teeth of Hurricane Daisy, which had 50-foot waves. So the, the crew is, is nauseated. And then came the warm water. The sub was designed for the cold Arctic waters up by Russia. It wasn't equipped to keep things cool. And so they got in those tropical waters and the temperature and that thing got like 120 degrees. So the men are dying in there. They're stressed. They're claustrophobic. They're hot. They're nauseous. And everything's very, very anxious and on edge. And in that setting, Moscow sends some new instructions to, to move from Havana closer to the coast of Florida. Very strange instructions, which they did. And of course, as soon as they got anywhere close to Florida, they are immediately surrounded by about a dozen American ships and destroyers and aircraft carriers. And so October 27, 1962, you've got this very tense situation. Four Russian submarines and a dozen American ships surrounding them very close to the coast of Florida. The American ships pretty quickly began setting off depth charges, which are like these minor explosions that are intended to bring up, you know, whoever's down there for identification and communication. Well, the Soviet submarine, was, which was called B-59, was trying to hide so deep that it wasn't getting radio signals. They're just hearing these depth charges. They think that war has broken out. And so they begin to panic. The, the captain loses his cool, and he calls a meeting, and he sends out an order, blast them, full-on attack. And what the Americans didn't know, and what I haven't told you yet, is that those four Soviet submarines were each armed with a nuclear warhead. Each one had a torpedo bomb of horrifying power that each one could destroy an American city on its own. And they're just miles off the Florida coast with a command to blast them. Fortunately, Vasily Arkhipov was on that submarine as well, and he was one of the three commanders, and he respectfully and quietly, as a kind of respected leader, um, in his own soft-spoken way, asked the captain to reconsider. Shouldn't we maybe 
surface and see what the Americans have in mind. And somehow his calmness persuaded the captain against his pride to do just that. And we actually have a picture here I want you to see. This is an actual picture of that submarine, B-59, surfacing. And you can see some of the American choppers and whatnot there. They were greeted by the Americans. They were not taken captive. And a few hours later, those subs dove back down and they headed back to Russia, where this story was kept under wraps for 40 years until the year 2002. U.S. Secretary of Defense Robert McNamara has said, we came this close to nuclear war. President Kennedy's uh, advisor said, this was not only the most dangerous moment in the Cold War, this was the most dangerous moment in the history of the world. But nuclear war was avoided that day because Vasily Arkhipov kept his calm, and his calm was contagious. And that's how it works in a time when things are tense. It's how it works in a family. It's how it works in a marriage. It's how it works at work. It's how it works in a church. It's how it works in a community. You're probably not going to spend three weeks cooped up in a tense you know, situation, sick in a submarine, right? But, but, but you are going to spend some time maybe cooped up at home, maybe uh, trying not to get sick, with some tensions high at, at your job, or who knows? And we all are sailing into some potentially choppy waters economically, aren't we? Or maybe your business is going to take a torpedo. I don't, we don't know. Maybe your kids are out of school and you don't know what you're going to do about that. Uh, or, or, or maybe you're just really bummed that your spring sports season is canceled. And that's a big deal to you. Or, or your Disney vacation, I heard someone say today, is off. You know, Disney's closed. Or you're just watching too much news and you're totally freaked out. Or your 401k is now shrunk down to a 301k, right? We've got lots of reasons that, that we can have our tensions high. And what we do is we spend a lot of time paying attention to what we hear and see and have received on the news and social media and the CDC website. And Paul says, pay attention to what you've heard and seen and received from me, from someone who understands this. And that's what we need to do because it's time for the people of God to demonstrate the peace of God. And that happens when you get your calm on. And that, my friend, is contagious because we're all going to have opportunities to hit the button, to send off a panic you know, attack or a torpedo of anger or anxiety and more anxiousness and release all that into the atmosphere. And God's people are just supposed to be different, to bring a non-anxious presence. I promise you there's someone in your life that God might need you to be sent by the Prince of Peace, Jesus, to bring a non-anxious, peaceful presence to them. Calm is contagious. Look at, look at what he says here. If you look at verse 4 and 5, he says, Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again, rejoice. And then he adds this on. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Let your gentleness be evident to all. It means have a level head. When others are panicking, their heads are bobbing, you've got a level head. You're not going to fly off the handle. If you're a follower of Jesus Christ, exude tranquility. Okay? Not like obliviousness to what's going on, but... Bring that non-anxious presence. Let your, evident, your, your gentleness be evident to all. Parents, your kids need to hear you talk about what's going on, maybe your own fears, but mostly they need your gentleness to be evident to them because fear is contagious and panic is, is, is epidemic and freaking out goes rival. We all know that. But a non-anxious presence is contagious too. And that feels more like the presence of Jesus who knew how to keep his calm in the midst of a storm. So think about what you're saying. Think about what you're posting. Think about how you're reacting because calm is contagious. Now i got to ask, how do, you, how do you catch a case of calmness, really? Is it just an act? If you're going to spread it, how do you catch it? How do you contract the virus of non-anxious presence? Well, Paul says it's about what you believe, Remember? And, and as you come to believe that, as what he says, the Lord is near, you'll see the two go together. Remember, he says, let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Those two go together. Anxiety spreads and grows when you think you're all on your own. And, and, and it's all up to you. God doesn't know. God doesn't care. And, 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 and of course, you're going to panic. 
and have anxiety. And that's how a lot of people look at problems. If they have problems in their life, their conclusion is, well, God must have left me. God must be absent because I have problems. If I walk into a divorce court, that can only mean God walked out on me. If I'm in a hospital, it means that God doesn't care for me. Or if I've got some kind of stress, you know, God must be absent. And this sort of thinking just is horrible because it means we're going to go through everything alone and we cut God off. I'm alone. I got problems and now I got to try to solve it myself and it just spirals and gets worse and worse and worse. And Paul says, hey, put your calm on, put your gentleness on display because listen, God is with you. The Lord is near. So you be the one who lets your gentleness be evident where you say, God is with me, God is with us, God is still here. Yeah, we got no more NBA basketball. Yeah, we got no March Madness. Man, I, I can't tell you how sad Jared was when he found out that there was no March Madness. Yeah, we got no Disney travel and all this stuff, but God hasn't left. God is here. God is near. Maybe your friend did leave you. Maybe your health is leaving you. Maybe your mind is leaving you. Maybe your kids are leaving you. Maybe your youth has left you. Well, don't forget, God has not left you. The, the presence of problems doesn't mean the absence of God. Just like Paul, you can put on a clinic of being calm. Because you know that no matter what's going on, the Lord is near and God is with us right now, my friend. You will never be where God is not. Over the next few days, hours, weeks, I don't know, months, maybe the rest of your life, can you just live with that? You'll never be where God is not. The Lord is here. Let your gentleness be evident to all. Keep your calm because it's contagious. The second thing in our CDC search here, the first one is that we can keep our calm on because that's contagious. And remember, the Lord is near. But the second belief that really anchors Paul in here is that Paul believed God was in control. And the word for that in the Bible is sovereignty. And so that's the D. You see it there. The D is in CDC stands for divine sovereignty. It's a big, long, fancy-sounding word, but sovereignty, you right, recognize right in the middle of that word, the word reign. It means that God reigns. He's the undisputed king of the universe, and nothing happens outside of his knowledge and control. He's reigning. He's sovereign. He's the king. And so Paul firmly believes that. It's so interesting to me that he barely gets started writing this letter to the Philippians, before he's talking about the sovereignty of God. It's crazy. He, um, you skip back to chapter 1 of Philippians, and what you notice there is, is that he does his little intro like he always does uh, with people when he starts his letters. Hi, y'all in Philippi. It's me, Paul. I love you. Grace and peace. Hey, I miss you. I'm praying for you. And then the first thing he does is he starts talking about the sovereignty of God. Look at verse 6. He says, And I am being confident of this, that he, he's talking about God, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. Friend, listen, God has begun a work in you, and it's good. And he hasn't given up, and he's not going to stop. And he will carry it on. God is going to finish the job. That's the good news. And I don't know what's going on in your life. I know we've all got curveballs that happen in life. And sometimes you may wonder, is God still with me at all? You know, what, what, what's happening here? Things don't always go as they're planned. We wonder if, you know, God, I thought he promised me this, and, and then it seems like maybe it's not happening. And you begin to wonder, you know, how is this going to work out? Where am I going? What am I doing? What's happening? And it can begin to build this anxiety inside of us, right? And you can say with Paul that you're confident. He says confident. You can say, I'm confident. The same God who started at work in me is going to finish the job. He's gonna, he hasn't abandoned me. He's still at work. And whatever it looks like in the world and my life, however it might appear, I am confident in divine sovereignty, which is a fancy way of saying, if you want to put your peace into practice, you need to put your faith into God. Let me say it again. If you want to put your peace into practice, put your faith in God. That's how you trust the sovereignty of God. He's in control. Sovereignty promises us that, 
that God is such a God that even when something goes bad, God can make it turn out right. Something wrong can turn out right because of the sovereignty of God. In verse 12, that's exactly what Paul says. He says, you know, here, you know, this thing that happened to me by getting thrown in jail has actually served to advance the gospel. I thought I was going to preach out there. I'm not. I got thrown in here. And then I thought, oh, wait a second. Look what God's doing. He's using this situation as only God could, and I'm preaching to everyone in here. And friend, that's the power of the sovereignty of God. It creates an expectancy in your mind where you, you say, well, I don't know, how, I don't like being where I am. I don't know what's going on here. But you know what? I can't wait to see what God does with this situation. I can't wait to, I don't just run around with my hands up in the air. What am I going to do? What am I going to do? I put my hands like this in prayer saying, God, what are you going to do? Because I know the sovereignty of God promises that God is going to finish what he started and I'm going to be able to have a story to tell. And I'm telling you right now, this whole coronavirus thing, God wants to do something in your life, in our church, in this community. He's going to take this thing that's bad and turn it because he's sovereign and he's in control. So we got to let him do it. You, you got to live with expectancy on that. Like, what are you going to do, God? He wants to use this situation to teach you. You're going to learn something. You can grow in some way. You know, there's all kinds of opportunities that are going to come by us. God's never met a situation where he's like, oh, I don't, I'm stumped now. I don't know what to do about this one. Didn't see that coming. Oh, my gosh, there's no oral spring training. I don't know what to do. God's never been in that situation. God is in control. Now, let's talk about that word control for a minute because we want it and we don't really have it. A lack of control creates a sense of fear, right? Isn't that true? A lack of control creates a sense of fear. When you're certain about something, that's easy. You know, you're, 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 you're not afraid. You're, you know the outcome. You're in control, right? But it's when you're uncertain, you're like, what's going to happen next? I don't know the outcome, that that creates all that energy. Now, sometimes it's kind of fun. That's why we love March Madness, right? There's nothing better than watching a live basketball game in real time. You don't know the outcome. And you're like biting your nails, jumping up and down, waiting to see what happens. And it's kind of fun when it's a sporting event. It's not fun when it's your life and you don't have control and you don't know what's going to happen. Control, when we lose it, is when we begin to feel anxiety. You know, there was a study done after World War II, and it was among um, combat and soldiers, and they were trying to study the emotional impact of, of who weathered the, the storm of combat better. And no one was surprised that the soldiers who were down in the trenches fared the worst. Like a few days of constant attack where they didn't know where the bullets were coming from or tear gas or mustard gas or if they, if they should run or hide or if they should hide where. You know, that totally exhausting and it, it affected their ability to cope with life. Their anxiety level was off the charts. What was surprising is that one group was relatively calm among all the other groups. And you know who it was? It was the fighter pilots. Now, fighter pilots had the highest mortality rate. The highest death rate, about one out of every two fighter pilots in World War II died in combat. And yet, 93% of them said they would sign up and re-enlist immediately. They had the highest death rate, the lowest anxiety rate, and the highest level of calm. Why? They dug into it, and here's what they found. The reason the fighter pilots had that result is that they had a sense of control. They literally had their hands on the controls and they could control the, where that plane was going and, where, and then where they could shoot the bullets and all of that. They were steering the plane. Whereas the soldiers on the ground were just vulnerable to whatever bullets were flying and the attacks of others. But the pilots at least felt like they had some kind of control. And if you feel like you're controlling your destiny, even if it goes badly, it creates a, at least an illusion of calm. And friends, I... I think this is why everyone goes to buy toilet paper right now. It's why you can't get toilet paper at the store. Does toilet paper solve the coronavirus? No, it does not. Okay? It won't help you with the virus. But I can get a hold of something and give myself the illusion that I'm doing something, I'm in control, and I'm preparing, and I've done something, right? You know, people are dying and, and, you know, this thing is spreading all over the planet, but I'm not scared. I've got Charmin. See, it gives us the illusion of control. And we love to have control. Even when we don't have control, we love the illusion of it. So we put a bubble wrap around our kids. We put a helmet on them. We, we don't get into relationships if we think we could get hurt because we want to control everything. And I, I tell you, I love control. 
People who work with me will tell you that. I, 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 I have to come to terms and burst my own bubble and yours right now and give you some news. You're not in control. You are not in control. You can eat vegan and eat granola and exercise every day of your life, and you are still going to, you, you could have a heart attack or a stroke or get hit by a beer truck just like that. You're not in control. You can love money and hide money and invest money and save money and protect your money, but you can still get it stolen or lose it in a collapse like that. You can protect your kids and pray for your kids and cover your kids and do all the safety courses and all that, and you know what? Stuff still happens to your loved ones, and I'm not trying to be depressing. I'm reminding us you can't control everything. You're not in control. In fact, the only thing that's certain is uncertainty. And this is why you know who is the most anxious? Control freaks. People who are insistent on controlling everything because that's how they're going to be in control. Well, you know what? They're very anxious. And to a degree, we're all like that. And that's why to, right now is such a hard time because some of the things that we thought we had control over, it's like, you know, we don't. And our confidence is shaken a little bit. And Paul says, not me. I'm confident. What's he confident in? Himself? No. Is he confident in his plans? Nope. Those weren't working out. Was he confident in his safety? Nope. He had no guarantee. What he's confident in is God because he knows God is in control. He believes in divine sovereignty. He knows it in his, in his head, his belief, and it's affecting his behavior. And so Paul says, instead of trying to control everything, you know what you need to do? Surrender control of everything to God. God's the only one who's in control anyway, so you might as well quit pretending like you're a fighter pilot, like that's gonna, it, it, you're still gonna get shot down. Surrender control of everything and then put it into practice. We need to do this right now, I think. Let me just ask you, you know, if you can think of some areas of your life where you need to, you, you're trying to control it. You're grabbing it like a roll of toilet paper, like it's gonna solve something. You know, you're trying to control that teenage kid of yours. You're trying to control your spouse. You're trying to control every situation at work and make it all come out exactly how you want it to. You're trying to control the coronavirus. I don't know. How's that working out for you, right? It doesn't work out very well. We can surrender it, though, to the only one who is in control, the sovereign God who reigns on high and rest in the strength and goodness of that God. And that's what we need to be able to do. The absence of problems is not the way we get to peace. We get to peace by surrendering everything to the only one who is in control to begin with. God is in control. He's large and he's never been surprised or given a situation that he can't handle. So do you believe in divine sovereignty? Do you believe God's in control? How firm is your faith in that belief? Because that will determine your behavior. Let me leave you with this. Think about it this way. Imagine three uh, passengers on a commercial flight, okay? Southwest Airlines or something like that, and they're all three sitting in a row. You, you got the window seat guy, and you got the middle seat guy, and you got the lady on the aisle. And they're all doing that, you know, kind of nonchalant elbow fighting for the armrest thing. And then before they take off, as they start to get in the air, they start to have a little conversation about the pilot of the plane. The guy next to the window says... Well, I don't think this plane even has a pilot. I, I, I mean, I came by, the door was closed. Why do you think the door's closed? Because they don't want us to see there's nobody in there. There's no pilot. I've never seen him. I think we're some kind of drone up here. Or maybe there's someone down in controls that looks on a screen once in a while, but we're on our own up here. And the guy in the middle seat says, oh, I don't think that's right at all. I think there's a pilot. I just, I just don't think he's awake. I've seen these pilots. You know why they close the door? It's because they read a book until they get sleepy and then they fall asleep. They just kick back. I've seen them walking around the airport with a pillow and, and a book. I, I know. I, I, I think we got a pilot, but I don't, he ain't flying this plane and he's, he's disengaged and he's asleep. And the lady on the aisle, she's calm as a cucumber. The other two guys are very nervous about their situation. And she says, you know what, guys? I'll tell you something. This plane definitely has a pilot, and he's a good pilot, he's a competent pilot, he's experienced, and he's alert, and nobody cares more about getting you and all of us 
safely home more than our pilot. And I, I can tell you this absolutely because I had breakfast with him this morning because the, the pilot is my husband. Okay, so that's pretty much the options we got. You got, you got someone who, who says there's no pilot, someone who says there's a pilot who's sleeping on the job and someone who says, I know the pilot and he's good and you can trust him. Fast forward 15 minutes and that plane hits rough turbulence, okay? Some rough air and they're bouncing around like popcorn in a bag. And you ask yourself, now what's their attitude right now? How do their beliefs affect their behavior in that moment? Do you think it matters whether they believe the Lord is near and the Lord is control? You better believe it does. The one next to the window and the one in the middle are totally freaked out and panicked. And the woman on the aisle, she may not like the turbulence. She may even be upset in her stomach. But I promise you this, she is not panicked. She's got peace. Why? She knows the pilot. She trusts the pilot. She's got a relationship. Let me ask you a big question today, friends. Who's flying your plane? Who's flying your plane? That's the question. We're all up in the air right now. We got some turbulence. It's going on. Our, our, our societies are definitely feeling it. And what you believe about God will determine how you get through these turbulent times. And God's Word's given us some beautiful counsel here. Around you will be some people who will say, I don't, I don't think there is a God. I, don't think we're, I think we're all on our own here, and they're going to try to control everything. And guess what? They're going to be anxious because they can't. There's going to be some other people who are going to say, I suppose there's a God, but you know what? He isn't helping much, or he's, he's asleep on the job, and they're going to be anxious too. But you can say, I am confident. With Paul, I am confident. You can say with millions of other people. You can say it with me. You can say it with the whole mountain family that there's a God who cares and is in control his hands are on the controls, and he actually knows what he's doing. He knows every passenger by name. He knows you, and he wants nothing more than to get you home safely. I hope you will take steps to know that God through this whole storm we're in right now. Wouldn't it be cool if God used this whole coronavirus thing to bring you to God in a way you haven't been in a long time, or maybe ever? We can still do baptisms. The governor didn't say we couldn't do that. You contact us, and we'll figure out a way to help you take your step to know Christ. And if you have been baptized and you're a believer, this is the time to say, I, I, I love and I know that pilot. Have breakfast with him. Have lunch with him. And have him bring you safely home. My friend, uh, go to the CDC for information about washing your hands and all of that. But CDC, we're going to cover the last one in the future. We're going to do the first two today. Calm is contagious. D is divine sovereignty. Trust that God's flying the plane.